Good morning, everyone. It's, uh, it's so great to be with you. Thanks, Charles, for reading your word to us. I'm Lou, one of the pastors here at Cross Culture. Wasn't it great? Uh, I promise this morning, just like the men's ministry, that we're going to finish exactly at 11 o'clock or maybe 11.30. Who knows? <laughs> but wasn't it great seeing those men out here at the front, hey? They're strong men. Humble. Wanting to be more like God. Yeah, it's an example to me, I can tell you. Well, right now we are in the middle of an eight-part series. We're going through chapters 15 to 18 of the Gospel of Luke. And uh, today I'm going to be looking at the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Maybe it should be Lazarus and the rich man, but anyway, that's what we're going to do. It's called, of course, Wealth and Self-Deception. We're systematically going through the whole Gospel of Luke together over something like four years. And two weeks ago, Pastor Devon told us, you know, he told us what the good part of going through the Bible systematically is all about. And today... I'm going to tell you what the bad part of doing that is. Today, I can't skip through the difficult things that the Bible speaks to us about. And we're going to have to face up to some of these difficult truths this morning about life and about death. So, let's pray. Our Father, help us as we, we need to have our ears cleaned so that we can listen to you because we desperately need to listen to you. We don't always want to hear the truth because we like things to be our way. But the Bible is your word and your word is truth to us. And we need to hear it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now after about uh, 37 years of marriage, actually 37 plus, you know, I find there's a few differences between Gail and I. So, for example, when she gets up in the morning, you know, she washes her face, she brushes her teeth, uh, she does her hair and and does her makeup. Uh, Now... I do exactly the same thing. Well, maybe I shave rather than doing makeup, who knows. But, you know, when Gail does it, she's always looking up at the mirror. Up at the mirror. Checking, you know, how she looks. Making sure she's getting it right. On the other hand, me, I'm a man. I don't need to look at the mirror. Now, of course... If you don't look at the mirror, you might miss a couple of bits every you know, now and again. Maybe you're not totally clean. You can't get it right, you know, if you don't see what you look like. Well, Jesus here tells this parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and he says it directly to the Pharisees. For example, if you look at uh, Luke chapter 14 and uh, sorry, chapter 16 and verse 14, it says, The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, heard all these things and they ridiculed Jesus. Now, what had these guys heard? Of course, uh, a couple of weeks back, uh, Pastor Devon told us uh, Jesus had told them the parable. It was about the dishonest but shrewd manager. You see, these guys, they loved money. And they wanted people to see their wealth. Because, you know, for them, for them, their wealth was like godliness. But Jesus, actually, he's not addressing wealth in this parable today. That's actually not his concern. That's not his issue. Jesus goes on in verse 15 there in chapter 16. He says, you're the ones who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts. For what's exalted among men and women is an abomination in the sight of God. You see, these Pharisees, they were people who only looked sideways. Sideways to other people. They never looked up to God. 
You want to look good in front of people? You want the praise of people in your life? Well, you know, when you're looking for people's praise, you often forget about God's gaze on your life. You know, their idea of right and wrong was just a man-made-up idea. And when they looked at Scripture, they just bent it to fit their own ideas. They never wanted, you know, they never wanted to see themselves in the way that God saw them. They were actually deceiving themselves and they deceived other people as well. You see, because people see what we do, but God looks on the heart. He looks on the heart of every man and every woman. As 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7 says, For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance. But the Lord, the Lord looks on the heart. So then Jesus goes on to share this parable of the rich man and Lazarus to put a mirror, a mirror up to the Pharisees to show them how God saw them. What life is like when we don't look up. What that would mean. You know, this is really a warning to the Pharisees and to people like them. So let's, let's begin. Let's see what we can learn from this parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Let's start off by looking at uh, what life looked like for the rich man and for Lazarus before they died. In verses 19 to 21, verse 19, it says, There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every single day. Wow. <laughs> Feasting sumptuously every day. Sounds great, doesn't it? <laughs> Probably with uh, his wealthy friends, maybe his five brothers as well. Did this guy observe the Sabbath? Didn't seem to be into much fasting, I don't imagine. He wasn't just rich, you see. He liked to show off his wealth. He liked to show off his extravagance. See, purple dye was, was priceless in those days was reserved for royalty only. He loved everybody to see just how wealthy he was. He loved it. You see, his lifestyle was more important to him than God's law. It was more important to him than the poor or his servants or anybody else really. That's what mattered to him. Then it goes on, verses 20 and 21. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Lazarus was a guy who lived on the edge of starvation every moment. Some kind people would uh, take him and put him at the rich man's gate every day, hoping every day that this rich man would, would give him just, just the crumbs that fell from his wealth, just to keep this guy alive. Crumbs that Lazarus desired, but it would seem never got. Even the dogs licked his sores. Now these are not pet dogs, let me assure you. They're going to just be wild, feral dogs. A bigger contrast you would never see, would you? Total tragedy on one side, total sumptuousness on the other. But the poor man, the poor man's got a name. The rich man doesn't have a name. The poor man has a name here in Jesus' parable. In fact, Lazarus is the 
only character in all of Jesus' parables who was given a name. Incredible, hey? Imagine that. Lazarus, this poor man, has a name. And the name Lazarus means God has helped. Well, we sure get the idea that he didn't get much help from people during his life, that's for sure. He's a man who depended on God. And he's in heaven now. Maybe our idea of help is, uh, is different from God's, eh? But we really see just how deep the rich man's sin is. Because he called Lazarus by name later on uh, in this parable. You know, it must take a really tough conscience to know someone by name. See them every single day. Know you can help them. But you just let them die. The rich man. He did the same thing with Moses and the prophets. The rich man knew all that Moses and the prophets were teaching, but he could not care less. Just as he couldn't care less about Lazarus. You know, there are a lot of hard up people here in the city of Melbourne. Right outside our door, actually. Just up there. There. On Swanson Street. And all over the place, really. How many of them do I know by name? You know, I'd be happy to take you out for lunch, you know, get to know you a little bit more because you look like a nice person. <sighs> but would I talk to a beggar on the street? Would I give them my time? Take an interest in them? You know, just talk to them, be, be friendly? You know, they need God as well as everyone else, don't they? Actually, we have a ministry here at our church. It's called Street Family Chapel. Meets every uh, Saturday. And they, they give a meal, but really much more than that. They provide friendship and uh, community for those people who are you know, sleeping rough. Because, you know, just giving money is sometimes a very easy way out, isn't it? Because, you know, God, God sees our heart. If you want to know more about Street Family uh, Chapel Ministry, then just go to our iHub after the service. I'll be happy to talk to you about it. They would love more people to get involved in Street Family Chapel. So if you'd like to, if you'd be interested, please do that. Now let's uh, move on to verses 22 to 23, where we see the reality of what awaits us after death. The rich man and Lazarus, they both die. Death. <gasps> The great equaliser, isn't it? Possessions, earthly status means nothing at all. See, we understand here, don't we, that God's standards, they're a whole lot different from, from mine. God's standards are so different, aren't they? He sees very differently. And we see now the stark contrast. We see the reality of what choices made on earth, that that determines what happens after death. And we notice here that you can't change things after death, can you? Can't change your mind, can't do anything else. And there's only two realities after death, heaven or hell? Verse 26 really tells us this. There's a great chasm fixed so deep and so wide that no one can cross over it. Nobody can get under it. Nobody can get around it. It's so big. It's an unbridgeable chasm. 
that no one can pass between heaven and hell. So if you're there, you're there forever. You'll never get out. You know, as a pastor, as a pastor, I am scared. I'm scared if I don't warn you enough about hell, about the truth of hell. I'm scared that I haven't done enough so that you appreciate just what hell is about and that you would take it seriously. All of us need to take it seriously. All of us have a choice in life. All of us need to choose to follow Jesus before it's too late. Now is the time. Not tomorrow. Not down the track. Now is the time to choose to follow Jesus. Because what happens if we don't is terrible. And you know, it's not like this rich man not like he was the greatest sinner on earth. He wasn't a murderer. He wasn't a pedophile or something, was he? He just lived for himself instead of God. He only worried about, um, about his life there on earth. He didn't seem to be concerned about eternity, did he? Actually, it sounds like a lot of people today, really, doesn't it? Jesus describes hell as the outer darkness, fury furnace, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, where the worm doesn't die and the fire is not quenched. Hell is a place of torment that lasts forever and ever. Hell is so, so bad that people don't want to believe it. So, instead of believing in hell, they'd rather believe in something else. Like universalism. Universalism is the idea that, you know, that a loving God wouldn't send anybody to hell. And that there's some good in every person. And, you know, some time you know when you die there'll be some time of cleansing your soul and then eventually all of us will get to heaven and that sounds really nice doesn't it or some people are believe in annihilation that god will let unrepentant sinners suffer for some period of time and then when when that's enough time he annihilates their soul so they exist no more rather than letting them suffer forever of course that would mean that the soul is not immortal i'm not sure about that then of course we've got purgatory purgatory is uh part of the teaching of the roman catholic and the orthodox uh, churches uh, they believe that when a believer dies uh, unless they've reached some level of uh, moral perfection they call it sainthood uh, then you go into some kind of intermediate place uh, where you've got to suffer until all your sins are purged from you. That's why they call it purgatory. But there is still hell for unbelievers. Of course, the problem with purgatory is uh, that they get it from one of the Apocrypha books uh, to Maccabees. And, um, of course, the other problem is that uh, other scripture uh, speaks against that. Uh, particularly our doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. So now, we have to ask ourselves a very obvious question. Why is there a hell? Why is there a hell? Well, the first best reason I can think of is that because Jesus says there is. In fact, he spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. And remember, Jesus loves you so much 
that he died on the cross for you. So much that he wants to warn you about the reality of hell. As uh, R.C. Sproul put it, the doctrine of eternal punishment in hell isn't pleasant. That's for sure. But you can't accept Jesus and reject hell because he taught it so plainly. He taught it so frequently. Secondly, we believe in hell because justice demands it. God says there is a day of judgment where everyone will have to give an account for the life that they have lived. And there, on judgment day, there will be perfect justice. You know, we don't really appreciate just how bad sin really is to a holy God. God hates sin with an infinite hatred. Well, on the other hand, for us, we think, well, you know, everybody sins. It's not really that big a deal, is it? We just sort of sugarcoat sin and we say, I repent. Do we really mean it? And forgiveness. We so easily take forgiveness for granted. We don't appreciate just how offensive sin is to God. And thirdly, while uh, God loves us, we don't all love God. You know, not everyone accepts God's love for them. And God does not force himself on people. You see, hell is a free choice that people make. Where a person chooses to be separated from God. And lastly, hell is the reason for the cross. I mean, if our sins don't deserve hell, then... What on earth did Jesus die for? To save us from what exactly? He saved us so that we could live in relationship with him. Rather than living away from him. Because that's hell. Now moving on to our last, our third and final point. What am I going to do about it? What on earth am I going to do about all this? Verses 24 to 31. Now, first of all, I want you to look at this rich man. After he dies, you notice actually he hasn't changed at all. I mean, this guy is in hell and he sees Lazarus in heaven. He sees where life has brought him. Does this guy repent? Does he even apologise to Lazarus for treating him so badly during his life? No, not at all. Does he say, good on you, Lazarus. Mate, you had it a lot harder than me. And you were faithful to God and I wasn't. No, no, he doesn't say that. Does he actually say a word at all to Lazarus? Actually just ignores him pays no attention to him, just like he did when they were on earth. He goes straight to Abraham, the patriarch. And what does he ask him? Send Lazarus to provide me with just a moment's relief from this torment. As if Lazarus is uh, his lackey or something. Yes, let's take Lazarus. Let's take him away from heaven. Uh, Let him, you know, cross this impossible chasm. Let him brave the fire of hell just to serve me because I deserve it. After all, I'm the guy who let him starve to death, aren't I? 
I think it just shows how hard and unrepentant this man's heart really was. But the rich man, he does show some concern for his five brothers, doesn't he? And he asks Abraham, send Lazarus to warn them about the reality of hell. Because he says, if someone comes back from the dead, then his brothers would believe. You know, we love the spectacular, don't we? You know, a lot of people have said something like that to me over the years. If God would just appear to me right here and now, then, then I'd believe. No, you wouldn't. Jesus performed stacks and stacks of miracles to thousands and thousands of people during his life. So tell me, how many of them were there at the cross when he was dying? How many people believed because of the miracles? The greatest proof of God is the word of God. God speaking to us and telling us truth and particularly now for us the word of God made flesh Jesus Christ God tells us the reality of life the rich man was in hell because because he refused to believe Moses and the prophets not because he was rich it didn't matter whether he was a rich man or a poor man. What mattered was that he refused to listen to God. Refused to listen to Moses and the prophets. Mate, this guy just lived a self-centered, self-indulgent life which actually just reflected the fact that he'd rejected God in his life. Listen to me for a moment. I want you to do something for me. Every morning, when you get up, I want you to go to the bathroom. It's usually a good idea. And I want you to look up at that mirror. You see, that mirror is the word of God. It's going to give you a true reflection of who you are, your character, how God sees you. It's going to show you where you're unclean. It will show the dirt in your life, the filthiness that's there. And then I want you to put your hands in that water in that basin of water because that basin of water is the cross of Jesus Christ standing there because only the cross can cleanse us and make us clean the cross is the only thing that can do that so every morning when you look at that mirror, I want you to remember that. And you know, when you get out of your bathroom, grab your Bible. Read it and pray. Listen to God in your life. And ask God, God, how do you see me? And a holy God He's going to be honest to you. And remember the cross. We go to the cross because the cross is the only thing that can change us. The power of God in our life. Don't try and do it in your own strength. And you know, One thing that I've learned from this passage. We need to ask God to give us a heart. A real heart for people. 
because we know they're going to hell. You know, I want this parable to really pierce my heart to have an, that I would have an undying concern for other people. It weighs heavily on us as Christians because when people die, then it's way too late. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you. Thank you for your word. Your word just cuts through the dampness and haze of our life cuts through our vague thinking. <laughs> Help us to have a good perspective, a right perspective, and uh, brings our lives into focus on what's uh, really important. Lord, if we uh, live apart from you, then life is uh, just a fantasy. It's really like an empty dream. Help us, Jesus, to understand this. And for all of us here today to devote ourselves wholly and completely to you. Help us, Lord, to begin with your word each day and to see ourselves in the way that you see us. And might we be your people to tell others the truth of the gospel, your truth. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.